Yeah, so welcome everyone to the second part of our session. Uh, I hope you all enjoyed the science talks in the first, uh, research talks in the first session. And in this session, uh, we will focus much more on the collaboration aspect with the first talk to be given by Kirsi Latola, who is the chair of the European Polar Board. Kirsi, please. Thank you, Renuka. So I will give you a very short introduction on European Polar Board, what it is, how we work and how we collaborate with other organizations and with some of the projects. And as you already know, this is last year was our 25th anniversary, which means that EPP was formed in 1995 as an advisory body to European Science, Science Foundation. Since January 2015, we have been an independent organization. We are hosted by Dutch Research Council, NWO, and our secretariat sits in Den Haag in Netherlands. We had planned, I have to say this, that we had great plans for last year for all our celebrations, but you all know what happened. So we have decided to postpone the anniversary year until this year as well. Hopefully we will be able to meet at some point also face to face. So EPP's mission is to promote, coordinate and advance the European research in high latitudes. It means that we are bipolar. We work in both Arctic and in the Antarctic. And we promote the cooperation for our members and between our members. And our secretariat in Den Haag acts as a single entry point, as a kind of a linkage between the other organizations and project and our members. We, of course, share a lot of knowledge. We do that by centrally from our secretariat, but also our members do that. And we are unique again in that way that we are in the center folder of the European Polar Research. We, our memberships include basically all the important European Polar Researchers, research field and platform. We have currently 28 members in 20 countries. You can see the acronyms of our members in my, my right hand of site. And then we collaborate a lot with the international partners, ISC and SCAR, as you know, we will sign our continuous MOU after these talks today. We collaborate with European partners, which means that we are also working in EU funded projects, but we also collaborate with others, European Space Agency, for example, and we have our regional counterparts and other organizations that act similar way. There's one AFOPS, which is an Asian, Asian organization and RAPAL, for example, from South America. And in central of all this, we have the secretariat that links together the partners and the EPP members. This is our strength basically, which is we have 67 research stations. Consalo already mentioned about this, and I have actually 33 in Antarctica and 34 in Arctic, which means that EEPP membership is not stable. We have gained new members and we have, have got new stations as well. Our members operate uh, 20 polar research vessel, which includes also the heavy icebreakers like Polarstern, you all know from Mosaic. And our newest member, Sir David Attenborough as well. And there are seven polar research aircraft, which, which means that we have airplanes who are able to operate in both Antarctica and in the Arctic. So how we work, how we do this in practice, we do this uh, work within our action groups. We have currently four action groups. And then we also work in projects, which are very often exter externally funded, which means that as EPP is now an independent organization, we can also be fully beneficiaries, for example, in EU funded projects. And we also cooperate with other organizations in the projects. And I have one slide on our action groups. I will not go deeper into this because the panel that follows, follows uh, later today or tonight goes much more deeper in these action groups. And we'll focus on the work that action groups are doing and what will be the future within these action groups. 
So four of these. In the list in the top, I have an action group on polar infrastructure, which is chaired by Mihel Angel Oyera Cardenes, or Miki, as we say to put it short. Miki is based at the Council for Scientific Research in Spain. And this action group's uh, main outcome so far has been a polar infrastructure catalog, which is a hard copy version, but there's also a polar infrastructure database, which is an online version, which is being constantly updating and expanded. And this work was done in a collaboration with, with FARO, GONMAP, Interact, Eurofleet and other organizations. We have Action Group on International Cooperation, chaired by Henry Burgess. Henry is based in Natural Environment uh, Research Council in UK and also in PASS. And one of the outcomes of this Action Group is obviously the MOU that we will sign shortly. We have Action Group on Environmental Impacts of Polar Research and Logistics, chaired by Tania Shiberian. Tania is based at the Luxembourg uh, Polar Program. She was not unfortunately able to join us, but we have Peter Elswood, who works at the EPP Secretariat, and Peter has been working closely with Tania, and, and he will be taking Tania's position in our panel later this evening. The main outcome of this action group is the report and guidelines on how to best minimize the environmental footprint in polar operations and in research. The action group started to work with the plastics, but it has been expanded to more on the overall environmental impacts and issues. Then we have the newest one, which is the policy advisory group. We have two vice chairs, Vito Vitali, Italia from Italian National Research Council and Alan Koch from Research Council of Norway, who are co white chairs. And because this policy advisory group is the new one, we are currently working on the terms of reference and, and building the practicalities how it will function. The main aim and the whole point of this action group is easy to act upon on request, which we receive very often, for example, from the European Commission when they ask information or advice on certain issues that, that they need for their policies. And of course, the whole point in, in this action group is that it would have the whole EPP members to support its action and work. Then I have a few slides about the projects. That's a kind of an example on, on what projects and on collaborations we are, we are working with. I have uh, ESA cooperation first, a choice epidemiology, which is a very nice research project that is that links European Space Agency and EPP members. And this is also a good example on how EPP has centrally been a link between the ESA and the projects and between our members. The main idea of this project is really that the Antarctic winter stations and stuff in there are used as a kind of an analog for space flights and their health is being monitoring and that is, is producing a very, very important and information, important information and, and very good, good results, I hope. I'm very much looking forward on what's going to happen within these projects. Then we have uh, EU funded, EU Horizon 2020 funded projects. EU Planet 2 is a project that EPB was, was also working in the first stage, but at second stage now we are also a full beneficiaries. We lead one of the work packages with it. With it. it has 25 partners and it really works on coordinating and co-designing the European research area, which means that we are doing research prioritization. We do that very much with the society and stakeholders, but EU Planet is also a bipolar, so we work in both poles. In this, I also personally are in, involved in EU Planet too. Then on the Antarctic side, we have SOSHIC, which is a Southern Ocean Carbon and Heat Impact on Climate, also funded by Horizon European, Horizon 2020. And then on Arctic, we have Interact that I'm 100% sure that most of you know very well. In, in third, Interact EPP is also working as a full beneficiary, and we are working on looking at the, what is the significance with the recently signed agreement on scientific cooperation and doing the policy briefings on that. We do a lot of cooperation in many ways. 
we work together in, in EU Polar Cluster. EU Polar Cluster is a, is a cluster of EU-funded polar programs. Projects, currently they are 21 polar projects. All SOCIC, Interact and EU Polarnet are, are partners in that. And we work through the task groups. There are task groups on stakeholder involvement, task groups on, on education, on data management and in communication. And European Space Agency has a similar cluster as they do have a polar science cluster. And as a, one of examples was a European Polar Science Week that was organized last October. That was a European Commission and ESA, ESA led uh, big week where we also collaborated and worked, it worked a lot. Obviously, there has been a lot of issues related to COVID-19 and there's always a lot of meetings and webinars going on, as you all know. EPP has been doing webinars long before the COVID-19 and that has been one of the main things that we have been doing, for example, with ABEX, when we have had a lot of training webinars. During the past year, we had a lot of knowledge sharing between our members on how to combine, how to get over the COVID-19 and how to better get our polar research, uh, logistics, stations, everything to go on, what, how to, what's going to happen, how to, how to continue the work and so on and so on. It has been a big mess, I can confess. Then we also had a meeting with, uh, between the polar EU polar cluster projects on the same topic. So as I said, the webinars are something that we have worked a lot and most recently we have hosted a webinar series for Arctic Science Ministerial, the third Arctic Science Ministerial meetings. In total, there will be eight webinars. So far, we have done five and all those five that have been completed are available on EPP's YouTube channel and the three to come are, are scheduled for April. There was a one that was rescheduled to April 15 that was on team three and team four will be in April 7th and then there will be a post ministerial meeting uh, webinar in June 9th. All these, as I mentioned, are in YouTube channels. We also have a 25th anniversary videos available. You can follow us on Twitter or in Facebook and you can also subscribe to our email list. Thank you. I would leave it in here and we will hear more about our 2050 years in the panel that follows the, the signing. Thank you very much, Kirsi, uh, for that. Uh, if there are any questions for Kirsi, please use the question and answer box. Uh, there will also be time to ask questions during the panel discussion, like Kirsi has said. Our next speaker is from SCAR. Uh, Catherine Ritz was one of the vice presidents of SCAR. And Catherine, thank you very much for making time to come on this session because I know you're having your delegates meeting right now. So thank you very much. And I hand over to you, Kat. Catherine, you're muted. Okay, Thank, do you hear me? Yeah. Um, so I'm a vice president of, uh, of SCAR for science and for a few days left because we are just in the process of the new election for vice presidents. Uh, I will speak about um, what is SCAR and what is the importance of having a, a Arctic Antarctic experience, uh, perspective and um, what is our experience of international cooperation and coordination. So what is SCAR? SCAR was established in, during the International Geophysical Year. So the 60th anniversary was um, done in Davos two years or three years ago. And uh, it is an interdisciplinary committee uh, of the ISC. SCAR 
mission is to initiate, develop, and coordinate high-quality international scientific research in the Antarctic region. The Antarctic region is Antarctica, the continent, the ice sheet, the surrounding Southern Ocean, including the Antarctic Circumpolar Current and Subantarctic Islands. The scientific bus business is conducted by SCAR science groups, which represents the scientific disciplines active in Antarctic research. SCAR also provides objective and independent scientific advice to the Antarctic Treaty consultative meetings and other organizations, of course, like uh, IPCC, for instance. So scopes, the first thing that is striking is that they are very international and, and interdisciplinary. Uh, there is a variety of size, uh, duration and objective, and it all depends on uh, what is exactly the objective. For instance, action groups are for usually for two years, eventually four years, and they must have uh, an objective uh, that is feasible during that time, like uh, providing a new map for the bed of Antarctica or things like this. Expert groups uh, may uh, last longer and usually they, they, have, they are experts that can be asked at any time about a, a, a question. I will speak a bit more about one of them that is uh, also supported by, by IASC. And these groups are under three scientific groups, uh, geoscience, physical science, and life science. And there are scientific research programs that may be across, uh, for instance, geoscience and uh, physical science. And three of them were recently launched and all the other ones were finishing last year. So the three that were launched is instance, that is Antarctic ice sheet dynamics and global sea level, that includes geoscience uh, for geology and the response of the ice sheet, of, of the crust to the ice sheet load, uh, some of the ocean, some of the atmosphere, um, past Antarctic ice sheet and everything we can find uh, about the limits of the past Antarctic ice sheet from uh, marine cores and even um, human science uh, group participate because it is global sea level, uh, it's part of the global sea level change and uh, uh, there, there is strong implication toward the stakeholders. UNCLIM now is near-term viability and prediction of the Antarctic climate system. And UNTICON is integrated science to support Antarctic and Southern Ocean conservation. They were launched in, uh, they were approved in October and they began uh, in 2021. So up to now, only instance has already had the kickoff meeting and there were more than 200 people participating to the kickoff meeting. So there are common scientific uh, problems that are tackled, that happens both or problems or concern or tools that happens in both Arctic and Antarctic. And very often the scientific communities overlap between Arctic and Antarctic. There are some geographic uh, things like there are polar regions and there is snow, sea ice, ice sheet, permafrost, ice. It's the only place where there is interaction. There is always interaction between ocean and atmosphere, but it is the only place where there is also interaction with ice and uh, also between ice and ecosystems. What is in common is very often the tools used for observations, for instance, uh, whether they are ground-based and remote sensing. And Ritz has shown how important is remote sensing in the assessment of what is happening to the ice sheets right now, but also models. Um, for instance, an ice sheet model is exactly the same uh, in, for Greenland or for Antarctica. So but we know the two ice sheets behave differently uh, under the forcing of uh, changing climate. But it's just the proportion um, of processes that is different, but the, the models are the same. The methods 
are also uh, shared between the communities working on Arctic and Antarctic. And of course, also the harsh conditions to, to do field work, although it's a little bit easier, I think, in Arctic, that makes very often uh, tools are developed in Arctic and then brought to Antarctic, where it's uh, much more complicated to, uh, on the logistic point of view. There are even spaces that are both in Arctic and Antarctic and migrate uh, between the two poles, uh, some birds and some fishes. What the two poles share also is a strong vulnerability to global change, whether it is for the ecosystems, the physical changes, and for instance, the contaminants, and I'm sure I forget some of them. And also the fact that they are not isolated. They, are, they have a, a strong role in the Earth, in the Earth system, uh, whether it is for sea level change, ocean circulation, because, because when uh, Greenland melts, uh, this may change the, the uh, thermal line circulation. And um, there is a whole range of questions about teleconnections between the two poles. There are also teleconnections with the tropic, but uh, there are also teleconnections between the two poles. And there is also the role of science in both cases, so it was really well shown in, in the uh, a previous presentation that science, it, it are places where uh, science, scientists are asked to give advice to stakeholders. So in Antarctica, it's a bit simpler because the treaty um, formalized much, uh, uh, much better uh, what are the stakeholders, while in Arctic, it's, it's more complicated. But still, I, I would consider that how to give advice to stakeholders is uh, a scientific discipline by itself, uh, because it's not obvious. And I think we would benefit from exchange between uh, the two communities. Uh, I, I like that Ritz Motram presented uh, Protect, which is an integrated European project where indeed there is Arctic, Antarctic, uh, and um, all the change of um, connections between the mass loss in the ice sheets towards uh, what happens on the coast. And uh, it's a really uh, an, an example of what could be done at a larger uh, and event, eventually on other topics uh, between Arctic and Antarctic scientific communities. There exist already links, official links, and for instance, still glaciology. Glaciology is really doesn't make difference between uh, north and south. So there is an expert group that is called ISMAS, that is SCAR, CLIC, and IASC, and um, that is ice sheet mass balance and sea level. Um, it's not a formal group uh, on the Arctic side, but IPICS uh, that deal with uh, uh, ice cores is also a group that is 50-50 uh, Arctic and Antarctic. Uh, the same, it's, it's the same teams that go uh, drilling in, in, in Greenland and then drilling in Antarctica and the chair results and uh, it's really completely Arctic and Antarctic for uh, Greenland and Antarctica ice cores are really uh, studied together. One event that happens every two years is a SCAR Open Science Conference and um, three years ago the, the Open Science Conference was explicitly Arctic, Antarctic, it, and was shared with between SCAR and IASC. This doesn't happen every, every open science con SCAR Open Science Conference because it, it gives a, a community rather wide. Uh, in Davos, there were 2,000 people, and uh, some people prefer to have some time there, the separated meetings. But there are at least some common sessions, especially the ISMAS sessions, but also teleconnection and Renuka. I think last time you were um, supposed to 
uh, chair a session of, for the Open Science Conference. Unfortunately, for the last Open Science Conference, we had to cancel the meeting and move uh, the most significant presentation online. And um, we couldn't have all the sessions uh, done. Uh, the experience was rather positive to move all the all the session well, everything we could online and one of the advantages for instance is that now you have all the presentations uh, on the YouTube uh, channel scar channel and to the extent that in the future we we plan to have the next open science conference on an hybrid form uh, I, with some people in person, if possible, it, it will be in India in 2022, and some person attending uh, remote, remotely. And the last existing common link that I'm, I think is very important is Apex. Apex doesn't make difference between North and South. They are, they are all working together, and it's the next generation of scientists and I think it's very important because they can share the tools. And uh, I was really impressed by what they did for in the review of the um, IPCC SROC. Uh, they they brought uh, they were the they made um, all the um, uh, analysis of the of the of the SROC uh, report. And um, Valérie Masson Delmotte told me that uh, Apex was the first contributor in terms of corrections, suggestions in the in the in the report. So I think it's very important, and uh, it could be a seed to expand more links between uh, SCAR, uh, European Polar Board, and uh, IASC. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kat, uh, for the wonderful introduction to SCAR. Um, Larry, are you ready to go with your presentation? I am, if uh, Joseph is ready to share. Yep, it's being shared now. Oh, super, thank you very much. Thanks for inviting me to uh, participate. I'm delighted to be a part of this, uh, this celebration, so thank you very much. And, uh, Thanks to all the previous presenters, it's been uh, a, a great, great session. And I'm particularly happy to, uh, to follow Catherine. This is a, a very nice, uh, nice introduction to, uh, to why polar research is important and why, why research at both poles is essential. Um, so I, I really want to uh, congratulate the European Polar Board on its 25th anniversary. This session is titled Europe in the International Polar Research 25 Years of Arctic and Antarctic Cooperation with the European Polar Board. And it's really important at these times to look back at, uh, at the history because a lot of the accomplishments, it's hard to really envision what those accomplishments are immediately in the aftermath. It takes time for a lot of these, these uh, activities to really flourish and grow and blossom and just really see the, the full impact of those investments. And so this is an important event. This is, uh, so, so congratulations on, on this milestone, but also congratulations on, on taking the time to think about where you are and where you've been. So I ask NSCAR have been partners with the European Polar Board since 2014. That's where we signed our initial uh, MOU. And, and for I ask, and I'm sure for SCAR too, it's very important that these MOUs, these agreements are real, that there's something substantive behind it. There's something real and not just a piece of paper. Now I am very pleased and proud of our partnership with the European Polar Board. I think there's some, there's some uh, really important achievements and, and I think it's been to the benefit of, uh, of not just the Arctic, but the global science community. And so today I'm gonna to, uh, talk about why, uh, why we cherish this relationship. So uh, next slide, please. So um, the Arctic, as Catherine so nicely described, the Arctic and the Antarctic are very vastly different, you know, almost 
polar opposites. Yeah, so everybody knows that as far as the, uh, I'm not gonna do the compare and contrast, but you know, I'm gonna speculate on why that matters and what the consequences are. And so as, as we pointed out, um, we've seen the, uh, the climate warming for many decades and the Arctic and the Antarctic have, had, have not responded identically, responded very differently. And polar scientists realize this and we understand this and we expect that they should not be the same. The Arctic is an ocean surrounded by land and the Antarctic is a continent surrounded by oceans. Most of the Arctic is near sea level and the Antarctic rises to nearly 5,000 meters, which is almost the top of the troposphere, which is in there is about 7,000 meters. Um, we can't understand both regions by studying only one. So both regions are influences and impacted by the global circulation in the ocean and the atmosphere. And more importantly, the polar regions have a direct effect upon that global circulation of water and heat. And that's really the, the essential crux of the story. That is why we must study both polar regions. Uh, the polar regions are often said to be the, the globe's thermostat. And what that means is that the poles have a negative radiation balance. That is, um, more energy has radiated to space as long wave radiation and hits the surface as short wave radiation. So uh, short wave radiation, for those of you who haven't studied physics of the radiation balance, short wave radiation is the light coming from the sun. And the long wave radiation is the heat that's emitted from the surface. If you hold your hand over a hot sidewalk and you feel that heat, that's, that's, uh, that's long wave radiation. So those two forms of energy, heat and light. And the polar regions don't get exposed and don't absorb so much heat as shortwave radiation. More is lost as longwave radiation. So the polar regions essentially balance the Earth's heat budget, energy budget, by emitting the excess heat to space as longwave radiation. And that heat that, that warms the more temperate regions is transported north or south to be lost to space and cool the planet. So, um, so think about that. This is why the polar regions are of such great concern to climatologists. When the polar regions warm, they cannot accept as much heat from the middle latitudes. And that slows down the heat transport of everything. That affects the Gulf Stream, which controls the temperature and weather of Western Europe. It affects the growing season, successful harvest of crops, species habit, habitat and migration, snow loads, flood frequencies, immigration, everything. And that's why we must study both polar regions. So that's, uh, that's why we, uh, we really value the European Polar Board's perspective on the, the whole global system. And so while I am very grateful that the European Polar Board supports both polar regions, that's not what we do. We study the Arctic. Uh, SCAR is focused on the Antarctic. And although I'm also grateful for what they do, I'm not gonna talk about them either. <laughs> So I ask, oh, I'm sorry, can you, uh, can you advance please, just to the next slide please? So the mission of IASC is to uh, encourage and facilitate cooperation in all aspects of Arctic research and in all countries engaged in Arctic research in all areas of the Arctic. Um, and we do this by promoting and supporting leading edge research to foster a greater scientific understanding of the Arctic region and this is the important part, and its role in the Earth system. And its role in the Earth system. That's also what the, the uh, SCAR is doing. That's also what the uh, Antarctic researchers are doing. We have to understand what influence the processes in the Arctic, what influences they have on the global climate system, how those teleconnections work, what impact that has to the, uh, to the climate, to the weather, to the extreme events in the more temperate regions. Uh, next slide, please. So to achieve our mission, what IS does is we initiate and coordinate and promote scientific activities at a circumpolar or international level. And it doesn't need to be circumpolar. We, we do a lot of work that's not pan-Arctic, but we are, really are focused on international collaborations, uh, promoting and fostering and, and achieving international collaborations. That's why IS exists. Um, we provide hopefully objective and independent scientific advice on issues of, of science in the Arctic. So we provide input to, uh, to the Arctic Council and to uh, uh, the various national governments of our uh, member nations. 
And we also have an extensive effort to uh, communicate scientific information to the public. Uh, Joseph, next slide, please. So I'm gonna just talk about a few of our activities. And one of our very important activities is ISERA, which is the International Science Initiative in the Russian Arctic. So IASC has long promoted the scientific research in the Russian Arctic. The uh, many years ago, many decades ago, we, we acknowledged that the Russian researchers were doing great work, but that science was not necessarily being propagated outside of Russia because so few non-Russian researchers read Russian. And, and also they were limited in some of their um, capabilities by lack of funding or lack of instruments. And so we promoted the, uh, the collaborations and the partnerships to, uh, to try and improve their, uh, their, uh, the, the work being done there and also to, to, to help propagate that information outward. So ICERA helps by initiating planning of research programs, um, providing a forum for, uh, for linking or, uh, or planning bilateral projects. Um, ICERA facilitates improved access to the Russian Arctic, which is very important and it is quite difficult to initiate access there and you really do need partnerships there. The work in the Russian Arctic really depends on personal relationships. And ICERA also assists on advising funding organizations for implementation of projects. And so I'm, I'm really proud of the work that ICERA has accomplished over the last um, 15 years. And I think uh, we've got uh, a bright future ahead. I ask is not a political organization in any way. We're a scientific organization. We stay out of uh, international politics and we're really focused on, uh, on just advancing the science. And we really do not focus on using science for diplomacy or, or anything else. We're focused on the science. SAON is another important program within IASC. And SAON is uh, purpose of that is to, is to support development of uh, sustained and coordinated Antarctic observing systems and data sharing. So the Arctic, like the Antarctic, is uh, very sparse in its observations. And so we, we do rely heavily on models and, and extrapolating the data that we do have. But the limitations of our models are primarily because due to the limitations of the observations. And so we really need to improve that. So SAN has uh, done some great work in trying to uh, extend and improve our, and maintain long-term observations. So SAM was actually uh, identified as an urgent need in both the first and second Arctic Science Ministerial meetings. And it's also described in the third uh, joint statement of the, of the Arctic Science Ministerial, which is coming up in May in Tokyo. So, so SAM is a, a collaborative um, long-term Pan-Arctic observing system that really drives what, it's, uh, what our action is based upon the societal needs. So everything that SIAN will promote has to be, there has to be uh, explicit societal benefits to it. And so SIAN really facilitates and coordinates international Pan-Arc observations and mobilizes support needed to sustain them. So Joseph, next slide, please. And the the uh, last activity I'm gonna talk about is just our, our Arctic Data Committee. And that, as I mentioned, we have so few observations that we really need to utilize those data to the best of our ability. We have to share those that information and make sure we can extract as most value from what, what we collect as, as possible. And so the Arctic Data Committee is actually, it's a collaborative committee between SAON and IAS. And they've done some wonderful work in the last well, decade. I think this has been around not such a long time. But um, they've done some great work in, in um, promoting and understanding data systems improving our data policies internationally, improving data infrastructures, and, and, and increasing the understanding of what it means to have ethically open access uh, to data, and then assuring attribution, and then trying to develop some standards and some interoperability of data. So it's also been a very important effort on our on the part at IASC. And my last slide, please, Joseph. So this is, this is the plug that I want to put forward for, for uh, everybody to think about. We just uh, started talking with Scar about this just a few days ago, and that it is really time for us to start thinking about the next International Polar Year. So the first International Polar Year was in 1882-1883, and the second International Polar Year was 50 years later in 32 and 33, 1932 and 33. 
And the International Geophysical Year was in 1957-58, um, 25 years later. We consider that it's the international it's the IGY, but we do consider it the third polar year. And then, of course, many of you may remember our fourth polar year, which is about 12 years ago, uh, which was 50 years after the IGY. And so now it's time, we should really believe that it, it's time to start thinking about the next IPY in 2032 and 2033. So that'll be uh, 25 years since uh, the most recent, the fourth IPY, and 75 years after the uh, International Geophysical Year, 100 years after the uh, second IPY, and 150 years after the first IPY. Now, the reason we, we believe this is important now is that the polar regions, both polar regions, are changing markedly. The fourth international polar year in 2007 and 8, we had a substantial efforts, huge efforts invested in, in developing baseline studies, baseline understandings of what was going on in the. Joseph, um, can you go to the next slide, please? There we go. There we go. Um, so the. Uh, some kind of thought here. Um, okay, so in the in the fourth international polar year in 2007 and 8, we had uh, substantial efforts invested in, in baseline studies in both poles, and so we have a really good understanding of where we stood at that point. Now that the polar regions are changing so much, after 25 years, we will see a substantial difference, and another polar year in 2032 and 2033 will help us get a better understanding of of those changes and what those, those implications, what those ramifications are. And one of the big problems that we had with the fourth IPY in 2007 was that there just wasn't the mechanisms established for international support of international programs. And so we, the, uh, you see the honeycomb um, graphic in the upper right here. That's, that graphic um, essentially uh, described all of the projects of the IPY. So there were projects in the Antarctic, in the Arctic, and in both areas. And in, uh, if you can see it better, we'll talk about the various uh, components of those studies. Those were all international studies, but they were not funded jointly across nations. And so it was really difficult to have joint projects. And so we think by starting 12 years before the uh, next planned IPY, we might be able to, to establish the uh, the understanding that the, the agreements that we need to get international funding of important IPY projects. So we're very hopeful that, uh, that this idea does go forward. So this is being promoted by IASC and the uh, IASA, which is the International Association of Social Scientists, and also by the University of the Arctic. We've invited uh, SCAR to join us and we've seen a very, um, very positive response. And so uh, we're going to be pushing on this for the next 12 years. And we hope that, uh, that all of you will join with us in, uh, in making this happen. So Joseph, my final slide, please. There we go. So with that, I will uh, thank you for your attention and I will end here. Thank you very much, Larry. And from EPP's side, I can tell you that we will be very happy to work with you for the planning of the next International Polar Year. Um, so the reason we are here today is that um, SCAR, IASC, and EPB share a common goal of working internationally on polar research and technology to increase our understanding of Earth's polar regions and their connections to the global systems. You have seen these from the brilliant presentations given by both SCAR and IASC. The purpose of the the purpose of the agreement that we have signed between the three organizations is to foster cooperation between uh, IASCAR and EPB members and to also define the terms and conditions for joint efforts, such as the IPY, as mentioned by Larry, uh, in developing international programs and other initiatives that are based on scientific priorities, scientific excellence, and use of Arctic and Ar Antarctic infrastructure for scientific and technological purposes. All of the organizations uh, recognize that their common interest to increase cooperation 
and to take advantage of the complementarities that exist in these three organizations. EPB, through its member organizations, provides the European dimension with a truly polar approach, a remit that covers both terrestrial and marine infrastructure and the capacity to involve national scientific or funding agencies within Europe. Through the network of scientists and various groups, uh, IASC and SCAR provide scientific priorities, facilitate international cooperation, initiate, develop, and coordinate high-quality international scientific research in the Arctic and Antarctic regions and on their role in the Earth systems. So now, um, EPB, SCAR, and IASC are reaffirming our commitment to cooperation at this time in this online session. Most of these things are generally held in a very low key way, but this time we are very happy that all of, all of you all could join us uh, in the celebration. So thank you very much for that. And yeah, uh, it's, it's just a celebration of this reaffirming our, our collaboration together. For the final part of the session, I now hand over to Kirsi Latola, who will lead on a panel discussion that will look at the next 25 years of European leadership in polar research. And this brings together all of our EPB's action group chairs. Thank you so much for joining us for this session. Thanks, Kirsi, Renoka. I hand over to you. And, and we should have somehow signed a MOU, but we would have loved to do that, obviously. So the way that I have uh, thought about this panel is that we will start with a very short introduction of each of the working group action groups. And then I have a few pre-thought questions. I will also open the floor to the audience to ask questions and please use the question and answer box for that. And then I will ask the final question in the end from our action group uh, chairs. And I have you in order of, of starting with the Miki, then Henry, Piotr, and, and Vito. Vito is, is giving an opening statement on behalf of the uh, policy advisory group. Miki, would you like to start with a short intro? Yes, I'm sure. Um, so the action group is uh, working on ready um, just to... Um, like an standing uh, issue that this is the, the, the polar infrastructure database. This is a growth from the uh, beginning as uh, Gonzalo uh, said previously in, in the early um, chat. So um, this is something that I have to be uh, keep and uh, maintain update and trying to uh, grow in a, in a proper way, connecting all the uh, infrastructure from the members and, and also uh, in maybe in the future with uh, some uh, science. And, and, and the other way that we are trying to work is um, trying to make uh, this um, infrastructure uh, more accessible. So uh, working in uh, harmonizing and um, standardizing um, procedures or uh, requirements to access to these infrastructures. And, and, and finally, uh, this is something that is also uh, working in the group is trying to find some um, mobile, mobile uh, infrastructure that can be operate uh, whatever infrastructure uh, within the uh, members, um, transporting and trying to be more operative. operative. Thanks, Mickey. Henry? Oh, many thanks, Kirsty, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for, thank you for staying right to the end. Uh, it's a pleasure to, pleasure to see you all. Um, Yes, I have the pleasure in leading the action group on international cooperation, the practical connections that we can help make, uh, particularly with those countries that aren't as well uh, international cooperation and international science as, as we might hope. Um, and so that's where we've been focusing our, our efforts. 
we nation and so we're very keen to make sure that the products that we uh, work on all together are, are very useful specifically for the EPB members. Uh, the where we've been focusing our initial efforts is on connections with Russia uh, and so we've been looking very closely uh, with uh, with colleagues at um, a kind of describing the uh, the, the potential connections and uh, research uh, links uh, between EPB members and colleagues in, in Russia. Uh, and so we're hoping to have something that will be uh, useful for, for colleagues um, kind of fairly, fairly shortly. And once that work is completely, completed, we'll then look at where we, can, where we can go next. But the group is very much about providing practical links and, and connections for, for members. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Henry. Peter, Peter will speak on behalf of Tanya. Yes, thank you, Kirsi. Um, indeed, Chair uh, Tadia is our chair, but unfortunately, she wasn't able to make it. So I'm uh, I'm working with her in the action group, and therefore, we'll tell you a little bit about the action group on environmental impacts of polar research and logistics. So the group was actually formed in 2018 uh, during the polar conference in Davos. And first the aim was to focus on plastics, but then it expanded its scope to all environmental issues. Right now, the group is working on a synthesis report for best practices um, for minimizing the environmental impacts of polar research and logistics. And this will include guidelines for researchers, station managers, program managers, project leaders, etc. cetera. And uh, we do this together with uh, other organizations, so we're working with Interact, Faro, and the SCAR Plastics in Polar Environmental Group, uh, and some others even. So thank you. Thanks, Peter. And then on Policy Advisory Group, uh, Vito? Yeah, good afternoon to everybody. Um, okay, the Policy Advisory Group is responsible to handling policy-related uh, requests coming from external or internal. We we just uh, are uh, re devoted to advise on science and, and research. We are not interested to, to address any requests uh, connected with the political issue. And so through the group, you, there is a possibility to have access to all the expertise and resources that the membership of FPP can provide in this way. So this is the very value of this group eventually. Uh, we can work on a standard request, but also we are discussing in which way we can also become useful for, for internal uh, items and uh, topics related to the policy uh, and related activities. Nope. Uh, you can make any request normally is, uh, is provided through the Secretariat and uh, as Kirsty told before, uh, we are in the moment trying to develop better the thermal reference and also a very robust uh, procedure that can assure uh, uh, mainly the, 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 the guarantee that the, the access to all the uh, expertise and also access to the to guarantee in some way neutrality on our answer and independency of our answer to, yeah. to the request. That's all. Thank you, Vito. So if you think about your action groups, so what do you think about that? What are your, your main target stakeholders? Are you working also for the other than researchers and science audience? Is there some other target stakeholders that you are, your work would be relevant? Would Mickey want to start well, again? Yeah, yeah, okay. I think that this is uh, really important to work with the other uh, networking um, actors in the in, in in both poles so uh, we have to be uh, really connect with um, uh, the other uh, projects or partners that are running uh, also with uh, infrastructure access or uh, money uh, in 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 Europe and and and, and on the world uh, like uh, SIOS or interact and and so on so um, try to um, be more uh, uh, trying to cover in uh, more uh, a partnership with, with the other actors. Uh, I think that this is, will be very important for us also. Mm. Any others? 
uh, from from the point of view of the Polish advisor, science and academia are the last. Probably we are not expecting requests of advice. We we should provide information from the science. So I believe the policymaker, uh, but uh, also we hope that an organization and uh, uh, even private sector can have interest to receive some uh, advice uh, with respect to the scientific and research uh, issue from a large uh, membership or an organization that can provide a lot of expertise, knowledge, and also practice on the, in the polar regions. And uh, a very good uh, point is that uh, APB can provide advice for Arctic and Antarctica. So this can also can provide uh, a, play, uh, a vision then combine the two aspects. Then it can have uh, some similarity and differences. So this can be uh, add the value from APB and so for the policy group to provide advice. Mm. And if you think about the society at large, there are of course also a lot of other stakeholders in the communities, the businesses, the industry, any relevance on your work to those, those other stakeholders? Peter, I would think that you would at least have some ideas. Well, um, yes, I do actually. So if you think about uh, first kind of stakeholders are, are for us, I think the EPB members, but to a larger extent, um, the environmental impact of research stations is something that's really relevant to anyone uh, living close directly to, to such a station, but also to, to a bigger extent to reduce uh, the environmental impact. So in that sense, I think, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's uh, important simply to do anything to limit environmental impacts. Hmm. Henry, do you have any ideas? Well, thanks, thanks, Chrissy. I the, the tension in all of this, of course, is, is it's a crowded field. It, it really is. I mean, one of the amazing things listening to the presentations in the last few days is how much work is already going on and how many connections there already are. And this isn't an area, any of it, where there is a, where there are any particular, um, well, the danger is that we end up duplicating each other's work. And mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a real pity. And so in, in all of this, and the skill is in, in finding the niche particular thing that we're doing whilst also making all the connections that we that we should and adding value wherever we can so I, that's the tension that I find kind of in a in 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 my professional life in the in the UK um, but I also see it with the with the action group and, and wider connections just how you add that value and make the connections and choose the right connections to make without spreading everything so thinly that we're all doing the same thing because there's no there's no value in that um, so I think that's a that's just something that we try and we try and bear in mind. Mm -hmm. And obviously, a cooperation within IASC and SCAR is, is very important as well. Nalan? Yes, thank you. I got inspired by uh, Henry's uh, comments, uh, and uh, that really is calling for uh, uh, collaboration, but more so uh, coordination. And uh, it, which brings me back to Larry's uh, news about the next IPY <laughs> in 2032. So, I mean, this is all a need for first defining priorities and then making sure that we have good plans for coordination because <laughs> the challenges, the scientific challenges uh, as we go into a climate crisis is so huge that there is a place for everyone to chip in. However, as Annie was saying, instead of doing this without being coordinated, trying to do everything, each member, maybe it's a very good idea to kind of highlight what are the priorities and who can chip in to which of these priorities and making a coordinated effort globally. So, I mean, uh, I am also seeing uh, uh, the European leadership. I was thinking, no, this is not about leadership. This is not about competition. It's about basically as a whole global community. And of course, within uh, the global community is maybe too large for uh, us alone 
to coordinate, but we can coordinate us within the European and then coordinate us uh, to the Asian uh, communities, to the uh, American communities. Just try to kind of find ways of uh, coordinating us, but we can start with our own <laughs> home base, the Europe, and coordinate us within Europe and then uh, expand to other to the whole globe basically because like i said the challenges are huge and the need for science and data are huge so there's a place for all of us thank you thank you nolan yes i think that that's true i'm looking at the chat uh, okay thanks larry <laughs> Some of you already kind of noted that what is the benefit of the work that your action group or EBB is doing for the polar communities and also beyond the Europe. But would you like to elaborate a little bit more that if there's something that comes to your mind that that what is really the benefit? What is the the, the reason why you tick, why you want to work? Uh, if I can start, I believe then the slides then was presented just before the beginning of the panel, the I, the, the I ask a scar and the APB in the middle. So this fact and uh, uh, this unique characteristic could bring link the two areas. For sure in Europe, we have uh, the biggest group that normally have activity in both poles in the Arctic and Antarctica that's very strong. Uh, experience and this uh, uh, duopole, two polar bipolar vision you can decide is very relevant, I believe, because uh, always from differences and similarity you can learn much more than from each if you look only to single of them. So uh, sorry for my English, that is very bad, but I believe the concept is uh, is clear in any case. Mm. Very good. Yeah, Thanks, Peter. Yeah, and, and another thing that I believe it is important that uh, we are all uh, trying to address uh, science questions. Uh, so we have, uh, in in our case, in the fracture uh, action group, uh, we 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 have to follow that uh, science are driving or uh, or um, and drifting just to uh, try to um, be sure that our members are uh, on, on the way that the science requests. Them. Do you think, Miki, that the work that you do has a benefit for the society outside the researchers and science? Well, I mean, I think that uh, at least all that we are doing have a, a, an impact in the society. We are um, trying to uh, answer questions mm. broadly. So um, um, I, I think that this is also a work we have to, to do is uh, an advertise and, 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 and express to the society what are we are doing and, and try to get more connected with uh, society. You know? So in, in, in our closely uh, partners, but uh, spread our word to uh, general society also. Mm. Mr. Nolan, yeah, go ahead. Mm. I thought of uh, giving one uh, example uh, regarding the society. Food is a big issue. It's a necessity. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the future, but already today, we are getting uh, a large proportion of our food also from the ocean, fisheries, among others. So, uh, for example, you have to manage your resources. And how do you manage your resources? In Norway, we have, uh, our government is using this uh, knowledge-based management. So we are managing our fisheries based on uh, scientific knowledge. And it's a uh, 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 based also on ecosystem uh, uh, management or looking at the whole ecosystem in the Bar and Sea and we do this uh, together with our uh, Russian colleagues but it's all based on scientific facts and then 
of course, uh, those working with the management and uh, making the decisions, then they have the data they need to able to take healthy, good uh, decisions on how much uh, quota there uh, should be this year from this area for this uh, certain uh, type of uh, fish so that we do not end up overfishing and killing the whole uh, fisheries in that area. So that's, uh, we're so connected with knowledge to the society. Thank you. Thanks, Nalan. Sometimes there just seems to be that they are not really connecting <laughs> in some issues. If you have the other panelists, if you have any questions, please raise your hand and be, feel free to ask at this point. There are no questions from the audience. At least I haven't got any. Joseph, have you got any? No? No? Uh, yeah, maybe. We, we, I, I think them can be very nice. Uh, the, the proposal, then the idea then are starting to have the next uh, year, polar year in, in 2032, 33 is. Uh, uh, in which way, and connecting this idea with what we are just saying about uh, the, the good connection with the society. So in which mm -hmm. way can promote, I believe then could be very important to, to make uh, the plan for the EPY, uh, the new uh, EPY in a very good connection with the, the, the agenda then uh, are developing at the political level or the, not the, the sustainable development goals or, or um, the societal needs, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, I believe then we should try to work in this direction since the beginning. So to to make a, a big success this uh, international polar year, and in this respect, in ten years I don't know what will uh, will be the Arctic in ten years from now. Really, considering the changes, and I remember my first time in the Arctic was in really in two thousand five, but. Uh, it's only 15 years ago, but uh, it's quite different now. And who among us are still working in in in, in the <laughs> world? That's also an interesting question. Kocha certainly will be because he's much younger than the rest of us. Nalan, that <laughs> brings to my mind that I have actually when Lir was talking about this IPY 2032, I had to think, hmm, how old will I? Will I be? 70. <laughs> 70. So, yeah. I mean, this also <laughs> reminds me of uh, another very important topic. Recruitment of the younger generation into polar science. Yes. And we shouldn't be waiting for 2032. This is a continuous uh, issue. So, it's an important uh, issue, recruitment of uh, the younger generation. Hmm. That's very good. So I have one question I wanted to kind of leave in the end, but it seems to be that people are getting tired and people are also, also leaving. So maybe I'll do another round with each one of the action group chairs uh, before we close. And that my final question was that, that how do you see your future plans? What comes next? What is the, the future of your, your action group? Well, I think that our uh, next close future is uh, trying to um, connect the infrastructure database uh, with science, uh, not, not to have already ours in EPB the science, but uh, link the, um, the database with the science because it's uh, our trigger. Um, so, uh, and this is uh, also related with the um, networking work that we need to do with the mm. other partners uh, um, uh, along the world. So I think that this is a, a huge and, and a big uh, challenge that uh, could be addressed in the next few years. Thanks, Mickey. Henry? Thanks, Kezi. Um, we're scheduled to have a, another action group meeting, I think, uh, in April. So I think we're going to take that opportunity and, and think about what our future tasks will be. Uh, we've looked predominantly north with, with Russian colleagues. 
So it might be time to look south um, and kind of reflect uh, reflect some of those links, or we might look somewhere that reflects both poles. Um, so uh, the work is up for grabs, but hopefully with uh, with you and other colleagues and Vito on the group, we'll, we can choose something uh, something good to focus on next with a good practical outcomes. Planning the IBY is also something that definitely has a Yes, not yours, not, just but not as just a whole. in the action group, but yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Piotr? Yeah, thank you. So I think everyone is really concerned about climate change and the impacts uh, on the planet, including researchers themselves. So that's why. Uh, the pros now. Pros completely. Do we lose, did we lose him as well? Yeah. yeah. So maybe we'll um, keep, yeah. Maybe I, can, we'll... I, can, I can take his place and just complete what he was trying to say. Um, I think we are, we are, everyone is getting concerned about the climate crisis that the planet is facing. And so any, any kind of work that we do to reduce our environmental impact as researchers is also going to be helpful for everyone around the planet. So I think, it, it's one of the goals of the environmental action, uh, the action group on environmental impact that once we gather this information, we'll make it available to not just the EPB members, but also well beyond our EPB members. Thanks. Mm. Then will it be Nala and Ovito? You can also answer both of you if you want to. What Paul is saying, we are a sort of reaction force. So our future depends on the request and expertise. But uh, so uh, we hope also that internally the IPB try to help to solve some question and uh, some related to the future in the new scenario then at the European level can, can be raised and also eventually to help this connection then is now started and more strong to the, thanks to the MO with the uh, SCAR and, and, and the ISC. So eventually try to, to, to to represent this sort of connection with the expertise, the large expertise that EPB can, can provide and be able to answer as better as possible to the request and try to promote this uh, capability and possibility in the stakeholders. So try to inform about this possibility and, and tool for the people. Thank you. Uh, I think we, we can actually end up with the closing of the panel now. It's always a bit challenging to do it this, this way instead of being in face to face, but you did good. Thank you so much. And I think that what have been said many times already during this evening is that cooperation, collaboration, coordination, three C's, those are the key things. And I think we are in very good place of, of continuing to do that and, and be even better on that. So thank you everyone for joining us tonight. And, and Renuka, do you want to take the, the final words? Yep. Thank you so much, Kirsi. I just wanted to thank everyone who joined us, uh, both on both all of the speakers. Uh, thank you for taking time off your busy schedule. Um, and also all of you from around the planet that have joined us. Uh, EPB has many, many exciting projects and uh, a lot of work ahead of us. As you've heard, some of the issues being, uh, some of the work being introduced today. You can definitely keep in touch via our mailing list, which is available on the EPB website uh, through our social media and also through our various communication activities like the session that we held here today. And thank you very much for joining us in this extended 25th anniversary celebrations and keep in touch and have a nice evening. Thank you, everyone. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Thanks a lot, everybody. Bye bye.